All right, so Finance Committee coming to order. Carol, are you with us on Zoom? Let's see, Carol. Well, we have our quorum. One, two, we three, do. four, five, six. So let's identify ourselves for the record. Lynn, you want to start? Lynn Bazzoli. Brian Hogan. Heather Morin. Howard D'Amico. Sam Kuypers. Dick Vandenberg. Okay, everybody have your minutes of October 25, which we did not approve. <laughs> we didn't. I checked, and uh, we ran out of time, and we just said we would do it later. Okay. So, and then I think we're pretty much caught up with minutes. Yeah. Did you have you guys have your copies of October 25? Everybody need one? No, I I'm emailed them to you earlier. Yeah, I read it. I read it online. Yeah, yeah we're good to go. Yeah. I make a motion we approve the meeting minutes. Of October, October 20, 25th. Okay, so motion made by Second. Ryan. Seconded by Heather. Heather. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstain. Motion carries. Oh, uh, just for the record, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. So um, Mike is absent, but he called me beforehand. And then Carol is supposed to be on during, for Zoom. And then everybody else is here, so that's good. Mr. Wojcik, you have the floor. We took your seat so I could see the board. Well, unfortunately, the board has been engineered to be not useful. Oh. Which is aggravating. Oh, so we're not using it? Not tonight. Oh, do you want your seat back then? I'll go No, this is, this is actually my normal seat. Oh, is it? I've got it. Anywhere where the camera is not pointed <laughs> towards the fact that I'm not as healthy as I used to be, like I can push way up like this, it's good for me. I like that. Oh. <laughs> so Matt, on the agenda we have report and then compensation table. So yeah, it's so kind of an overview of stuff that <laughs> the numbers are rolling in. So I will go through what I've got in terms of some of our major categories. Uh, Norfolk Aggie and correspondence dated yesterday uh, has disclosed their tuition increase for the next fiscal year, which represents just about a 7.25% increase for their tuition. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and we're carrying one more student than we had historically, so I think there was someone who matriculated as a sophomore. So. Next year, the way I project our cost for Norfolk Aggie is I roll the population forward. So this year, right now, we have three freshmen, two sophomores, three juniors, and five seniors. The five seniors will graduate. There are four applications right now at Norfolk. Typically, they almost all get in. I was, there's been a year where somebody declined to go, but they got in. So I just budget all four of them as getting in. So that's a net drop of one. But then the tuition is increasing. More concerning to me is the transportation budget for Norfolk Aggie is going up by 19.1%. So that is your budget proxy. So the final number isn't in yet, but they're saying, you know, what cost us a little over 20,000 last year is going to cost us closer to 25,000 this year. Some of that may be because they had negotiated their bus contract for a while, so there's some catch up that the bus companies are doing with COVID. But there's also fuel costs and insurance costs that are just coming through. The reason why that's concerning is because if that comes through our Telstone contract as well, a similar number, that is a huge problem in terms of being able to balance the budget. That causes a great deal of pressure. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know what they've got cooking. They had a big increase last year. I'm hoping that they made up some ground last year, or the year we're in, the last budget we did, in that it would, I always put them, <coughs> pardon me, I always put them in for a high increase because I just figure um, the pressures in the, in the transportation industry usually filter through. So it's not like we're going, we were assuming it would be a zero and we're gonna now throw it in at a 15 and oh my God. But it may be more like a seven or an eight, and going to 19 would still be a really big increase, so it's concerning. So that's Norfolk Aggie. 
Um, <clears throat> we have a preliminary uh, health insurance renewal and um, it has not yet been shared with or voted on by the board of our joint purchasing group so I don't feel comfortable giving the exact number. I will say that it is well in keeping with our historical pattern for the last four years. Um, and there is potential for it to be revised downward because we continue to have Sorry. Sure. Uh, excellent uh, claims experience numbers through the month of January. So <clears throat> if our current trend were to hold, I would be comfortable, I think the, our board would be comfortable maybe taking a point off our renewal, a percentage point which would take us slightly below our historical average. If you know what our historical average is, you know what I'm saying exactly. Because <laughs> I just gave you all the data points you needed to solve for x, uh, without actually saying what x is. <clears throat> Most people would be phenomenally jealous of what we're doing, um, because that rate of increase is very, very low. Um, <clears throat> we now have a fair amount of historical data behind what we're doing. So I think the thing that makes everybody's eyes pop out of their head is our trend as a group. So our overall health costs of our group year over year, our trend is 4%, which is insane. So the market's seeing 8%, 10%, but we're, we're beating it by half, which is considerable. Fantastic. So <clears throat> we continue to be optimistic about the group. The pressure this year will have pressure in two directions. One is I think I've already mentioned this to you, but our reinsurance rates, our stop loss rates will be up. That is about 6% of the total cost of the group. So <clears throat> there'll be some pressure there that'll offset the positives of what we've been doing. Um, offsetting that is cost reduction. So we have a number of programs that address acute illness, chronic illness, and our approach to carrying out specialty pharmaceuticals and other pharmaceuticals and moving them into more efficient delivery programs, um, generating large surplus for the, in the form of rebates. We are, this doesn't affect Douglas, but I will say this much, one of the conditions of joining our group is to migrate all retirees who are not on the towns, a towns, Medicare supported supplemental program. So they would go from a fully, a, a family plan for instance, and they are being told you have to migrate to Medicare and the group will pay your Part B penalties and any other Part B premiums. This just makes so much sense. Uh, there's one neighboring community next to, to Douglas where we've saved close to $357,000 in one year by migrating their elder population all onto Medicare supplement. Medicare Advantage program. <coughs> so <coughs> we continue to demonstrate the value. Um, <coughs> pardon me. So that's health insurance. The other upward pressure for us is our census. So more people are taking the town's benefit uh, compared to historical levels. So we always over budget the census. So we, we say, well, this is our census right now, but we're going to budget for additional family plans and individual plans just in case we have some new employees or some people switch over to our plan. So we are usually five or six plans over our estimated census. Right now we have 179 actives. We budgeted for 178. Hmm. Uh, on the retiree side we budgeted for 112. We actually have 116. So we're just a little bit above that. I think for this year, so next year our, our, we'll have to revise our model upwards as well for next year. So there's an impact of that. Um, so that's most of our fixed costs. We're going to be talking to our property and casualty carrier tomorrow for one of about four meetings in a row where they will offer a number of excuses for why they can't give us any idea what our renewal is going to be. <laughs> So the annual dance with Maya, I think last year they actually gave us a renewal after town meeting. It's typical. Yeah. So <clears throat> we will take a stab at what that number is going to be. Um, 
cautiously optimistic about that number because as time marches on and big claims get further in the past, they, they are weighted at a lower number in terms of factoring in our experience. Um, that brings us to the topic at hand. <clears throat> Before I pass around the deck, I <coughs> I'm sorry. I don't know what, maybe I'm allergic to Howard's chocolate. Um, <laughs> pardon me. In a typical year, which has inspired him to pick up a piece and eat it. I don't have a camera on me. <laughs> <laughs> um, in a typical year, we would prepare, I would prepare at least a detailed personnel budget and get our best estimates on our major fixed costs and BVT and all the things that disrupt our budget. And there would be this trade-off as we go through and how much am I going to tell my department heads that they can increase their expense budgets versus how much are we going to allocate to the COLA. And that's a, I don't want to call it a negotiation, but it's a, it's, it's a balancing act to find a level of COLA that would keep us, especially our non-union staff, up to par with their union counterparts working for the same town. <clears throat> and at the same time addressing some you know, historical, relatively lean expense budgets that are really not sustainable over the medium to long term. So there was always this balance. This year we're trying to do comp reform. So that means that the big pressure item is going to be the personnel budget. So it's following a slightly different path this year, right? So we're going to still try to get our fixed numbers, and we're telling department heads, keep your expense budget to about a 1% or 1.5 max mm. above fiscal 23. Mm. And then what we have left will almost all go into compensation reform. And we may still have to do some balancing, which may include making the comp reform plan a two-year rollout instead of one. Because we're not going to put all our eggs in the basket this year if we really can't afford it. We'll, we'll push it out. <clears throat> because we already did a 4% COLA last year for non-union staff. So we, we knew we would have a huge gap to cover, so we started to try to the COLA last year would have been about 1.75, so I threw another two and a quarter at it to try to get progress towards the eventual goal. Um, <clears throat> so that is, I don't want to say intellectually, but that is the, the math problem we're trying to solve. We're just using slightly different order of operations to get to the, a balanced budget this year. So with that having been said, I'll pass this around. And my apologies, I got this stinking whiteboard so that we could have but some of the charts I'm going to show you would be much more effective if you could actually see them. Um, <clears throat> but it was, the whiteboard was set up so it could be shared on Zoom calls. And unfortunately, what that means is that I am not the user. So I can't log into this computer at the same time as Douglas Cable is logged into it, so it actually defeats the purpose of having the board. We will get this right eventually. Uh, <laughs> was any of this on SharePoint then, Matt? No. So okay. <clears throat> I look for it, but no. Okay. All right. <clears throat> this still is. Um, let me put it this way: the process itself is winding down to its last couple of steps. The content is still sensitive or work in progress, and should be treated as such. So, if you don't mind, I'll collect these back. Um, so that we can maintain editorial control over the message. But I think there is so much that goes into this kind of thing that we really got to get in on the ground floor so that when you finally do see numbers, you'll, you'll know how I got there. So there were, are no numbers tonight. We're not going to. I told the Finance Committee before, Mr. Chairman, through you and the Select Board as well, <clears throat> that I would like this program to come in somewhere around a quarter million dollars. And I have, because I can't resist the temptation, because I'm a numbers guy, I have thrown that spaghetti on the wall to see where I might be with this. And I'm yeah. confident that we will hit that number. I'm not so confident of if I can accommodate that entire number in one year's budget. It's a different question. But uh, this first slide 
the first four bullet points here are the major principles that we are trying to adjust to. And the first is that uh, we, we have observations that we have fallen behind many communities in the region and in comparison with towns of similar size across the entire Commonwealth in our rates for compensation for many, but importantly, not all of our positions. And I will show you some examples later in this discussion of both cases. One of the things that has happened is that we have had some retirements and one departure from staff. So we've replaced people in the last two years and we had to advertise and then negotiate with successful candidates, salaries. Those people are going to be much more competitive than those folks who've worked for Douglas for a long time and have not had their position advertised. One of the big oopsie doopsie guffaws that we don't want to repeat is having someone who has been extremely faithful to the town and really served us well retire. Then we post their position at a salary that's actually pretty much the same what they were earning after 15, 20 years with the town of Douglas, mm. and then have the new candidate come and say, you gotta give me a five grand kicker, I'm not coming. And now you're 10, 15% above the person who was just here doing a, a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. That will not be sustainable over time. People will eventually get discouraged. And I'm sure there are those who are discouraged now. When I presented this to staff, I had one person say, this is long overdue, this is where we need to be. And I got the feeling from the reaction in the room that he was speaking for everyone. Um, at the same time, we can't afford to be leaders here. That, that is not Douglas. We're not price leaders at all. Uh, we're price takers in the market. And so the goal would be not to try to overshoot, and nor should we try to be at the very bottom, because that will only mean that the problem will repeat itself in a couple of years and all this effort will be for naught. So, I'm thinking that if we are at the top of the bottom third, we have achieved a sustainable position because then what we can do going forward is use our COLA policy to better keep up with competition in the marketplace. And <clears throat> um, I think there's a there there to that and obviously we'll, we'll model that out mathematically to be sure that we're right about that. But. Um, the benchmarking process is not a perfect science. We're not gonna get 100 examples and have 100 data points of towns just like Douglas because we're all very different. Every municipality, the job description is slightly different. Community might be more or less wealthy than Douglas, maybe experiencing more or less growth, and you're gonna use a certain amount of artistic interpretation to see where we should be. And um, that is the, probably the biggest part of the lift here is that there is some art involved and what are the sources of data? The MMA has a website where positions are posted. It's a busy website. There's a lot of towns hiring. So finding analogous communities to us that are recruiting is not that hard. Some positions are more commonly advertised than others. Um, but that is a primary source to see what would anybody looking for employment for a job that we have here in Douglas be expected to be paid if they were successful. And to put brass tacks, what would an existing employee of Douglas think they might get for a raise if they were to leave us? Right. Right. So that's, that's probably the most important part of the benchmarking effort. Um, we will use some recent postings from other communities, even if they're not a lot like us, because it can help establish upper and lower bounds. So. Uh, I don't expect we'll ever be competitive with Dover or Hull <laughs> or any other community that's got oceanfront property and might still be fairly isolated, have a hard time recruiting. Because that's that the double whammy. You see a lot of Cape Towns, you see their salaries are high. Because who wants to make that long commute? And yet the property value is, is high, so the tax base is strong and they're able to, to increase their revenue every year. We can still use those as upper and lower bounds. So on the lower side, you're gonna have a lot of Worcester County towns, perhaps to the west and north of Worcester, 
that are about the same size as us, have a similar size budget, and yet there are fewer job opportunities. So people are, are going to be more willing, and this is a long drive, as you can imagine, to Ashburnham. It's a different kind of commute than to Douglas. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm pretty Matt, much through that. Go can ahead. I ask you sure. on that point? So, Do you have an idea of what you perceive to be kind of a geographical circle, 30 miles, 40 miles, 50 miles, where 80 to 90 percent of both applicants and new hires come from, and also where current people might leave to go to? Yeah, so that is going to be, Mr. Chairman, if I may, the, the bulk of our comparison set. So even though Uxbridge may be 75% bigger than us in terms of population. It's right next door. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that, that has to be in the comparison set. Mm -hmm. Sutton, Oxford. Mm -hmm. I don't know about Webster because I think there are some differences. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> then you look a little bit in either direction. So you're going to look at you know, maybe Munson's pretty far away, but it's very similar to us. You might go as far over Hopdale, Hop, uh, Hopedale, not Hopdale. I was about to say Hopkinton. So Hopkinton, Hopedale, um, and communities of that size. I'm not obviously ever going to look at Rhode Island because totally different, right? They're, they participate in Social Security. They set wages accordingly. It's a whole bunch of differences. Um, same with Connecticut. Same with Connecticut. Okay. It's going to be, it, and, and the communities that are relatively close to us are not really okay. good comparisons. Okay. So really looking at Commonwealth. Communities on an arc, then 25 west, north, east, yeah, 30, pretty much. Maybe. Okay, all right, yeah. thank you. Sure. The next uh, slide that I pulled out of the deck to show you is I just wanted you to be able to visualize. So, this is 12 fiscal years, it says series one, two, because I haven't labeled the series yet, apparently. But uh, that last data point would be. Uh, fiscal 23 and you're going back to about fiscal 11 all the way on the left and these are index values so I just set the salary in 2011 equals 100 and then for each year right I'm going to take that year's salary and divide it by 2011 salary and it's going to come up with a number that's going to be a function that's larger than one but basically what is the percentage of the 2011 salary that you're being paid now. <clears throat> These are all Douglas positions. I want to show you what we've done with our existing staff and with our contracts. The curve that grows most rapidly is fire department lieutenant, step one. And you can see that its, it's index value is just about 142.5. So. A Douglas fire lieutenant today is making 42.5% more than they were 11, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. That is the result of a conscious policy to change the way we compensate lieutenants. So it was just a little gimme, a little throw, you know, a little stipend that was thrown onto the basic wage of a firefighter paramedic, and there wasn't necessarily a job description that increased that person's. Uh, level of control over the situation. We now have a lieutenant on every shift because there's always going to be somebody in charge and we look to that lieutenant to be a much more experienced person. So a minimum of five years of experience, preferably with us, but doesn't necessarily work that way. Who, <clears throat> again, preferably has all of their firefighting credentials in their paramedic, so a higher level of uh, skills. And then creating that separation from a fairly well compensated firefighter paramedic is necessary to give them the incentive to aspire to be a lieutenant. There has to be that, that gap. But the firefighter contract in general has had that effect of pushing those salaries up and the same for the police contract. So you see a sergeant step four is the blue line and a patrolman step five is the yellow line and they are both resting at index values over 25%. So their salaries have gone up 25% over the subject period. There's a couple of things that have happened. One is the table in the police contract has been moved to stay competitive 
with other communities as part of the ongoing process of negotiating their contracts. They have also had incentives built into their contract for accreditation. So that is a higher level of professionalism and they just got renewed in the last few weeks. So there's been, one year there was a flat dollar amount that was given as a bonus for accomplishing that and now it's a 1% that's built into the base of the contract. So that explains the police. Those lower numbers, so our office assistant step two, uh, office assistant step one, and uh, that PM2, that's a highway grade. You see where they are. They have risen the slowest. And the only reason why those non-union salaries went up in the, the last year was because of that 4% COLA that we threw into the budget last year. But you can see that the gap, even internally in town, between the non-union staff versus those that are represented by unions with collective bargaining agreements, that's a gap too that we need to close. And that's why we've been focused on the non-union staff and not the entire employment base of the town. So when it shows up in the budget, it won't show up in the police department very much. It will show up because of dispatchers. It won't show up very much in the fire department. We have one non-union person there. It's going to show up in the town hall budgets and the highway. Okay. What's M5, step one? So that's management. That's the highest grade in management. So that's a department head. Entry level pay for department head. It actually doesn't show up because it is under the gray curve. Okay. Same thing with the red one? Yes. I can't see that either? Yep. Okay. So their, their index value is the same because they all got the same COLA. Okay. Um, so the process. Typically, a municipality would think about at least going out to a university. Usually it's UMass, some Cormac Center, or somebody who's focused on studying public uh, administration and have them do a compensation study, you know, wage classification study, and they'd come back and tell you a whole bunch of stuff you already knew and give you a bill for $40,000 and say, you know, I'll be brilliant. And I wasn't inclined to follow that for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is you already have a compensation system that has worked for many years. So we're not looking to completely upend it. The, the skill sets are the skill sets, right? We may want to identify them. We may want to adjust them. In my case, I'd like to consolidate some of the, you know, wide variety of salary rates when all of the skill sets are kind of bunched up in one area. Uh, so you have a really strong base to build on. Secondly, uh, this is an opportunity for the administration of the town. So town administrator, finance director, you know, town treasurer, benefit staff to really get more connected with our, so th this could be an iterative process with a lot of dialogue and that's healthy. Whereas talking to somebody from outside, you may be able to have your gripe session, but you're not really addressing the person or the people you work with to see your point of view. Can I interject a minute, yeah. Matt? So Carol, I see you're on the screen. Are you listening? Can you hear us? Because I wonder, Jean, if we could send her an email so she can follow along with us. Because she just doesn't have anything to go along with us now, I wonder. Carol, can you hear us or not? I see your name on the screen. Well, we'll assume she's there. <laughs> and probably muted. So carry on, Matt, okay? Uh, yeah, are you okay if I send that to her? Do you have a hard cut? Because it's not the whole back. Because you want it to be private, it's, right? It's on SharePoint. Oh, I would suggest that the presentation can be represented relatively well verbally. Okay. <laughs> because there's no actual numerical input. 
Okay. So I'd rather not have it circulate. So, Carol, just listen as Matt talks, okay? <laughs> I will, I'll do my best. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's... Yeah. I, my consulting days, I'm rusty, but I can still give a presentation. Um, so we're going to follow a... The, we are following this process, and I will tell you where, which bullet point we're on in a second. The first step is to review and update all job descriptions. So <clears throat> uh, this has been many years in the making. It has taken us a good three or four years to really go through the whole organization and make sure everyone has an up-to-date job description that has been vetted by Labor Council and voted by the Select Board as the valid job description for that title. So that, a lot of those documents either did not exist when I started or dated back to a long time ago when skill sets were different. Technologies made a lot of changes. So we went right back to all of the staff and asked them to review. Uh, in those cases where we have done recent job postings, we had a more recent job description, so we, we got all that lined up. Uh, <clears throat> we had to create, secondly, a scoring system for each critical skill set. So this is part of the art. You know, what makes a manager a manager? What aspects in municipal government of your day-to-day -day work distinguish you from hourly employees? And what is the public's expectation of what a manager accomplishes? And in the case of management, you'll see, because I think we, we go back and describe them in a later slide, you know, eight critical areas. Many of them are intuitive, right? So there's your fiscal management, your asset management, your day-to-day -day supervision of staff, management of confidential information. For each different job, these are common points, common foundation points for what makes that person a manager under the law. But some people will have demonstrated those skills at a much higher level than others. It stands the test of reason if I'm managing a team of six or seven people every day, especially if it's manual labor and we're going to move supplies and equipment and have everything all set up. That's very different management burden than somebody who's managing one or two people or nobody at all. Um, and these gradations need to be both meaningful and actionable. You, you need to be able to say to someone, your rate of compensation will be X because there are a number of things that you demonstrably don't have to do every day. It has to be and survive the test of reason. The other trick to this, if you will, is determining, okay, so generically, what is the most important set of skills for any management level employee to have in the municipal government setting? And because we don't want to overweight or equally weight some aspects of these jobs that almost everybody shares in common or which don't really drive a huge difference. So you know, management of confidential information is one example. Many of us have access to statutory protected information. Um, but just because a person has access to the most sensitive information in the world doesn't mean that they are managing at the highest level of challenge. So you don't want that one metric to be so well, it's so important we got to compensate that person as a level four manager. Well, wait a minute, There's, they don't manage anybody, they don't have a budget, et cetera, et cetera. So each of those skill sets would also be weighted to add up to 100 because it makes the math a heck of a lot easier. So then you take your scoring system and you rate everyone by their job description. Very important that the folks that are involved in this separate the job from the person that currently occupies it, or whatever their impressions are of performance. It's take the job description and objectively review it against the, the rubric you've established and score each job. And we've had five people involved with that, so um, the town administrator, Jean as the finance director, uh, Cheryl the treasurer, Cheryl Vadia, um, Holly Cottonwar, our benefits administrator and assistant treasurer, and uh, Lisa Freeman, who is my assistant and assistant to the select board and a longtime employee of the town. I think if you add it up, 
take me out of the equation if you add up the total time. Holly's relatively new too, but between Lisa, Jean, and Cheryl, there's a tremendous amount of experience working for the town. So you've got a lot of the history, institutional history, as well as people who have good perspective, because we deal with all these folks on a regular basis. So um, we've met several times, and we rated all the positions. We took the average of our impressions, and we've begun to gather and analyze benchmarks. The next, the step we're on is this next bullet point: check results with current employees. So we have next Tuesday scheduled soup to nuts from first first light in the morning to late in the, the day to meet round one. Meet with management level employees to review their job description, their rating, and how that's going to shake out in terms of the new system. Probably show them a number, not necessarily show them a number, but just give them an opportunity to give feedback on the different skills, because we may, we may not appreciate something that somebody's doing, we want to hear it in their own words. Uh, and after that, or simultaneous with that, what I think is the only way to do this and have any tie back to some rigor is look at your data set, use some simple mathematical tools to drive an average, and then call that average. What is that average going to be? It's not going to be your entry level because you're going to have a lot of data in your data set that reflects what towns are paying other people who may have been working there for a while. So we're going to call it, say, step five. Right, and then we'll reason back using our table to what the entry level for that grade would be. And hope to set that at the top of the bottom third of the set. All right, so it, that sounds complicated, but really that's like two moves in a spray, spreadsheet. I'm gonna take all the information, I'm gonna add, I'm gonna come up with an average. I'm gonna set that average to a, a point in our range, and then calculate our range accordingly to make sure that the entry level is at the top of the third of the whole set. Um, <clears throat> once we do that, we'll have a program cost, and then we'll try to figure out how it works in the budget. So simultaneous with that effort, we're developing the budget on a bunch of milestones that probably won't be able to be changed very much. Um, before I, I dive into, and I'm going to glance over the next two slides a little bit, because I don't know how much it helps. I'm, I don't have a slide in the deck yet for this conversation, but you've heard me say it before. So I'll, for purposes of this presentation, I'll repeat myself. We're going to do away with a couple of things. The 10-step system, which is very, it was designed to be a merit system. So it wasn't designed to have any tie back to longevity of time of time in the seat. The reality has been that evaluations haven't been done and merit raises haven't been pursued. And these have become basically, you start work, you start at step two. Next year it's step three, guess what? And you're, you're, then you're step four. And it just, until you get to step 10, then you stop and you don't get any further steps. And that model is, is fine as long as you are still progressing. But once you get to step 10, you get whatever COLA the, the town can afford to give you. And if that's a low amount, then you start to slip behind other, other towns. So the thought process for me is longevity does matter, loyalty does matter, because the experience you garner working with the public here and working with the town, this physical layout, if, you're if your job is tied to street locations, everything, the more you do it, the better you get, the more value you create. I have always liked, I was in the system once and I actually thought it worked pretty good for morale, the system that is used by many, the major public employee union in Rhode Island, and the state government. You, you start off at a probationary wage, so you, you don't even make step one. You make about 95% of step one for the first six months. You go through the tryout. Most managers don't really put you through your paces. <laughs> it is, after all, state government. But then, once you've been there for six months, you fully come into your step one pay, and you stay at that rate for another year to get step two, and then step three. So you get, within the first three years of working, you get four steps. 
right? Because that takes you that much time to learn to do your job and hopefully you're doing it well. Thereafter, it gets tied more to longevity than experience. So you might not get another step until step year five and then not another one until year 10. Those milestones will be somewhat larger than our existing milestones. So right now, the difference between each step is two and a quarter percent. So you gain that for the first 10 years and then you stop. If you spread that trajectory out over a longer period of time, then you know your steps are gonna be six, seven percent, but you have to wait five years to get them. And then your merit system kicks in because your manager should have the opportunity to accelerate you on your time scale, on your time path, if you've done a wonderful job, and they just want to be able to do that. Matt, um, so if you're between steps, you still get the cola in between yes. then? Okay. Yep, the whole table should move with the cola. Now, what this will mean for us, and this will be an interesting thing to find out once we finally get to it, is we'll never have a year where everybody gets a step at the same time because they're staggered, right? So. The, our, the pressure on our personnel budget would occur if we have a whole bunch of new employees starting at the same time. So for their first two or three steps, the budget will reflect their progress and it would be a lot of people making that progress at two or three percent a year each year. But then it would spread out. That gap is where you can make up the difference with COLA or at least have more policy options with the COLA to keep salaries competitive using the COLA device rather than waiting for somebody to get into another step. Uh, and I plan on five year increments up to step 30. To be blunt, if anybody's here for 35 years or more, they're losing money coming to work every day <laughs> under <laughs> current pension rules. So after step 30, you kind of, you know, you make up your own choices. Uh, but we do have two employees who've been here for more than 30 years. so. We have to be cognizant of, of the value added. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to run through this as an example. I, I do intend to go through it very quickly. So if you have a question, please ask the chair to stop me. But when we rated management positions, day-to-day -day supervision and span of control was one metric. The administration and execution of discipline is another. And I, we separated this apart because this is a completely different skill set that many people think they're going to have when they get hired to be, quote unquote, the boss. They think it means I'm going to tell other people what to do. But the tough part of the job is when they say, no, I don't want to do that, or I'm not going to do it the way you said. And now you have to have that difficult conversation. Well, I think you need a couple of days off to think about <laughs> And to be honest, look, you need training to do that. You cannot just jump into a role because today's employment rules are so complex and we have to be so careful on the way we address people and how we couch these difficult conversations so as to not have it turned back against us that discipline is a true management skill that deserves. So I, I, if you've got somebody who's managing eight, nine, ten people and they face the challenge of trying to keep order with that group, that's very different than somebody who doesn't manage anybody else. Mm -hmm. Not that I've been through this recently or anything. Um, confidential information I think we already talked about. Asset management, critical skill set, right? So I suppose it's a pet peeve of any number of town administrators and managers around and you know you get very different levels of engagement and skill around asset management. Some people think I'm just going to drive this truck until it breaks down and then I'll call the repairman and that's really all I have to do. And that is not good asset management. Asset management is I've been given a, a million dollar truck and I've got to make sure I do my annual inspections and put the oil in and that is what a responsible manager should be doing. So it needs to be part of our understanding of rating management skills. So anybody who's managing a building plus a fleet plus major components of our IT network should get a higher rate of pay than somebody who does. Fiscal management speaks for itself. That's the budget. Are you turning anything back? How big is your budget? How many different variables are you managing? And the last two, one is interaction with the state. The other is interaction with the public. Mm -hmm. I think interaction with the state is one of the things that my guess would be the public doesn't understand as well as we do. 
local government is a creature of the state. It is entirely created by the statutes and the different structures that are put in place for procurement, the wages we pay, for contractors, all, all of those rules are set in place and many of our enforcement people are enforcing state codes. <laughs> they're, they're answerable locally, but they are involved with whether it's the state fire code or the building code, electrical, plumbing, you name it. There are people in the state government who you answer to and those conversations can be less than pleasant. It's a relationship you have to build and manage over time. And it's a skill that uh, any number of people who work here need to have. And then lastly is interaction with the public. We all understand the public is our true boss. And the more intense and frequent that interaction, uh, your, your professionalism can be tested. We have all kinds of people running around today. Social media has made it possible to punch somebody in the nose anonymously over and over again, uh, even if it's meritless punching. And uh, there has to be some recognition of the fact that some folks really come to work every day and deal with the public in a much more significant way than others. Um, <clears throat> so we went through all those management positions, rated them all against those metrics, and because I'm a consulting geek, I love histograms. This is a histogram. Each point is a position, and the rating scale is the scale on the left of the, of the slide. And what we're looking for is groups. You know, do the dots all come together in a band? Because those people probably have, on average, the same, a mix of skills that leads them to the same general skill level. And I didn't draw any in the middle because I didn't, I'm not entirely sure exactly how this is going to pan out. <coughs> we clearly have two positions that have very high levels of responsibility and that was a consensus opinion amongst everybody who looked at them. We have five, maybe six, I think, because uh, I, I have one or two to add to this, uh, that are, they, you know, they're going to be averaging around a level two uh, or two score. That will actually be the M1 management level because I'm going to consolidate why do we need five grades of management for crying out loud we only have like six people so at that level of department head so <clears throat> we're going to try to get M5 down to M4 so four levels <clears throat> and there's some scatters in the middle but I think if you follow my eye there are three positions above level three in the about six of them around just a little over two and a half as an average rating that would be your M2 schedule. All right, so that, that's how that will pan out. That's how those positions will be assigned in the grading system. Being mindful of the fact that once we set the rates, that person's longevity with the town will inform where they are in terms of their actual pay. So let's give an example. Let's say that a certain level of management is going to come out to about 100000 as a as a step-in wage. Because we could not hire somebody into that job today unless we offered 100000 mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that the manager who sits in that position right now and makes 105 is being fairly compensated if they've been working for us for 20 years. That person will be at step 20 on that scale. So we may have to hire at 100, but that person isn't going to make 105, they're going to make 120. Okay, so that's, that's the crux of this. That's where the cost will come in. Mm -hmm. So I thought it would be helpful for you to see some of the work in progress on the benchmarks so you can see the different types of examples that we're working with. Building commissioner, really hard position to fill. Nobody wants this job, to be blunt. Okay, they have to read like 14 books. It's a stack this high. They take six different tests. Uh, the tests are actually really hard. And uh, you can't punch your ticket until you do it all. And you can't have the job unless you punch your ticket. So there's been a lot of upward pressure on this position. So the four towns that are advertising now or have advertised recently are Medway, Wayland, Medfield, and Fairhaven. Um, Wayland might be a little bit out of our consideration set, but I'm going to keep them in because of where they came in with their position here. 
But you can see where, and I have to give my colleague in Medway a little bit of grief about this, but he's got his building commission over 100,000. Uh, Medfield would be the lowest of the recruiting group and it looks like they're right around 82.5. So Matt, is, but do the dots represent yes, midfield. the same amount of experience for each town? Then? No, the dots are just where they are right now. Right now, oh I see, okay. Yep, so the, if there's a range shown, so I just took, this is a your classic day-to-day uh, -day stock report. <laughs> Open, close, <laughs> settle. <laughs> I just defined the midpoint as where I think the midpoint of the range of their salary scale would be. Because they're advertising their whole range. The midpoint is where somebody would be halfway into their career. <clears throat> so you can see where those four towns that are advertising seem to be. And then the rest of these uh, come from annual reports, budgets, other sources of information. And then Douglas will always be on the far right. So as you go through these charts, you look at Douglas is on the far right. And, you know, he's just a little bit over 80. And I think he's in a step three. Oh, he's been with us for at least three years. So that gives you a sense of where that particular position stacks up. And some of these, in this particular case, these are really good comparisons. So you have Sutton, Sturbridge, Millis. Medway's not that far. So these are all towns that are, are pretty close. So I think the, the decision here would be, yes, this particular position is undercompensated, so we have to make sure that when we set the ranges that we address that for this particular grade of management. Uh, treasurer collector, another position that's apparently quite hard to fill because everybody's out trying to find someone. Um, the Kushnets out there are trying to get somebody at a yard sale to be their treasurer. That's not going to work, by the way. So that's a brand new advertisement. And again, this is a town manager that I'm familiar with. I'm going to have to give him a hard time because nobody's going to take that. <coughs> Especially not in a Kushnet. Um, but some of these others are fairly decent, like Plainville and Millis uh, are not bad analogs. In this particular case, Douglas is not the lowest. It is more in the mid-range. What that doesn't take into account, though, is that our treasurer has a lot of time. Mm. Right? So even though we set this opening salary at a competitive level and said maybe the salary that's paid right now is competitive, but that person is a 15 or more year employee, so that, that salary would be adjusted. This next example, community development director, again, a position that's being advertised in many places, but we just hired this person in the last year and a half. So I would argue that Douglas's compensation for community development director is very competitive. Hmm. Right. So as we go through establishing salary levels, there's not as much pressure to make an adjustment here. So that's where we're at. Uh, because of the time frame that we're dealing with, we're in mid-February already, uh, my goal is to finish this off with office assistant grades, our highway staff, and any other non-union staff, really in the next two weeks. I have a question. The towns on here that are on here, how were they chosen? So they have to be similar in size to us. So I don't really have any choice with who's <coughs> recruiting right now. I mean, I just picked that. Okay, and those uh, are the ones with the line through. Yes. Okay. So obviously I'm not going to do anything crazy. Like, I don't care right. if Chelsea's hiring or New Bedford or... Like, uh, that comparing doesn't... us to Westboro, like... Right. Okay. Um, but that is a... So if you were looking, though, yeah. that would be the advertisement you see. This is the job I do right now. I'm going to go to a bigger town, but for crying out loud, I'm going to get 50 grand more? I'll see you, right? I'll, let me, I'm going to take a shot at it. But the others, where I just have a single point, um, I, we all have access to the Division of Local Services uh, database, yeah. which allows us to sort towns by population and the size of their budget and the average income levels. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to stay within a band that wasn't much bigger than plus or minus 2,000 
in population. So we're like we're kind of like Plainville and Millis. Okay. Littleton's another one. You know, and obviously the closer you get to Boston and the other side of 495, you have to. You need those data points, but you're also, you know you're gonna discount those data points a little bit because somebody from Douglas isn't gonna, I don't think, chase the job in Littleton. And you know, that's, that's just out there because that will be discussed at professional organizations, but you're really gonna be focusing on what Sutton, Uxbridge, you know, towns around here uh, are paying. What I don't want to do though is So Lester is in the consideration set. So Lester mm -hmm. typically doesn't pay as aggressively as many other towns. Okay. Uh, frankly, some positions Sutton does, some positions Sutton doesn't. Uh, Uxbridge tends to be you know, playing catch up just like Douglas is. So you're, you're capturing all that. If you do too many rural Lister County towns, you, I don't think you're gonna get a good set because that's really not what we're competing against. It really isn't. We might hire somebody from there, but it's highly unlikely that somebody from here is gonna go. Um, but you didn't use like the same towns each for each? Community. No, because in some cases, they either don't have a position that's analogous to us, okay. or um, there was some problem with the data. So if I looked at an annual report, like if they had a staff transition and a position, they may have hired the new person at a different wage than the old person in it, but they're only showing the budget result. So you're not really, I don't have enough information to solve the problem. Okay. How many months did that guy work versus this person right. to know what the actual salary is there? Could um, you do a search by town if you wanted? Like I want to see what Blackstone is? Yep. You could be that specific if you wanted to. Yeah, and then of course it's how do you get the information. So I, I had the tendency to favor towns that had an annual town report like Douglas's, okay. where we put the salary, everybody's salary in it. Yeah. If I had to adjust it for their coli, I would just adjust it. That's why you see the word, the, the abbreviation estimated, because in some cases uh, I got annual reports that are two years old. Right. But that doesn't mean I can't use the number, I'm just going to inflate it by 2% cola each year and, and use a number. And what website do you find this, this at? So the Division of Local Services, okay, which is part of the Department of Revenue. Okay, By the way, for a finance committee, it's a fantastic website. They have done a lot in the last three years. You can pull up all kinds of comparative data for any town you want to see. Mm -hmm. Free cash, unrestricted reserve balances, uh, um, economically equated value, which is a, a term they use to calculate some of the formula. Uh, <clears throat> value of the town, you know, the, the value of all the property of the town. Uh, there's just a million ways you can cut and slice the data. And if you, I can, Mr. Chairman, I'll just email everyone the link that oh, can go great. to the that's municipal great. dashboard and you can see, you know. Uh, What's it called again though? It's the Division of Local Services, and I think they're calling it the Municipal Finance Dashboard. Yeah, that would be great, man. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's super helpful because they do time series that we would that we don't have, we don't track. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it takes a little bit of work sometimes to recreate our history of free cash or some of the other things, and there it's a chart. And they're using the same basis to analyze everybody's data, so they're, they're normalizing it a little bit. Um, I think it's really informative to see our unrestricted fund balance, you know, the change that has occurred over the last five, six years, and um, compare that to other towns that have higher bond ratings than us to see where we might end up. <laughs> Little things like that. So Matt, in terms of information for us as the, the Finance Committee, we could log on to SharePoint at some point and just see your spreadsheet of departments and, and dollar amounts and so on. Is the compensation table that you're working on, will that be, will we foresee that as we get ready to review the Warren articles because it no, will be a too Warren? Late. So when, when will we see your results? Will so we see them on SharePoint then too or not? Uh, you will. Okay. So well, as I, that was the line of conversation I was going down and then I stopped and changed direction in about two weeks. Okay. Uh, 
So if I go on to SharePoint, what will I look for? What will it be it, called? It compensation reform proposal. Okay. And that'll be different than your regular spreadsheet where you put... It'll probably be a PowerPoint deck. And then when you see the budget spreadsheet, you'll actually see those numbers plugged into the compensation. Ah, uh, okay. So what I'm doing right now... Gotcha, yep. This is a, a slight degree of tedium, <laughs> but I'm, I have every single year tried to improve the budget spreadsheet that drives our budget compensation. <clears throat> I'm just going to put in a plug here. I don't sign up for these whiz-bang software packages that a lot of towns do, whether it's called ClearGov or OpenGov, and they have this budget program that's written in C++ and you get all kinds of really great graphics. The problem is, is you don't control it. You don't, you can't click on a cell and see what that person's formulas are, what their assumptions are, what it ties back to. So even though it's more work, I continue to use an Excel-based spreadsheet program because I want to be able to run scenarios. I don't want to just look at historical stuff. I want to do a lot of what ifs. And I want to see the interrelationship between departments more as a systems dynamic than a simple spreadsheet. So I can't unbundle that when I use that fancy stuff. So this year's improvement is I have broken, typically I had everybody enter data into the master budget spreadsheet itself. It's kind of an intimidating screen to be in front of because you've got 10 years of history and five years of forecast and the department head sitting there and trying to maybe stay in the right column and uh, I broke that out. Each department now has two spreadsheets to fill out. One is for compensation, the other is for expenses. And the history is still there and the forecast is still there. <coughs> but all the department head has to do is type in their numbers for this year, what they project they'll spend on electricity, gas, and all that. The forecast will automatically populate based on rules that I've established, formulas that can be changed though. But then the master budget spreadsheet isn't anything anybody has to touch. It's just going to grab through cell references. It's going to grab everything the department head puts in. It's going to go right into the master spreadsheet. When everybody is finished, we'll look at the bottom line. We'll say, oh my god, it's red. <laughs> and then we'll go back through the iterative process. Budget instructions include one really strong caveat this year. We are not doing an aspirational budget. I don't know if I'll ever engage in that exercise again, and at least not for another couple of years. It was informative, right? I think everybody got to see what, if they could spend a reasonable amount of money, which are what our department heads would do, how they would go spend it and increase things. Remember, what did I start with last year? I think I started with like a $565,000 deficit and had to pare back. Now I'm listening to people say, well, you cut me, you cut me. And I said, no, that wasn't the exercise. It didn't cut you. I actually gave you more money than you got the year before. I just didn't fund your aspirational budget. This year I know we don't have a lot of resources, so I don't even want to go there. You have 1%. Figure out how you're going to run your department with a 1% expense increase. And if you absolutely don't think you can do it, then let's go to the Finance Committee and talk about it. Because this is the place where the decision will be made, because we may end up with a very thin cushion and you'll have 10 proposals for an amount of money that's good enough to fund two or three of them. And I think that's where leadership of the town comes in. We, we present you with all the information. You make the choices. So the, the numbers that the compensation reform generate will find their way into that master spreadsheet. Yes. So somehow. On their compensation worksheets, they must show their roster who that person is, what step, what grade and step they're at, that refers back to the chart, pulls over their salary for that individual, then it sums at the bottom, and the master spreadsheet pulls the sum into the compensation line of the budget. A simple spreadsheet. Assuming the math has been structured in a way to head toward the goal now. Yes. Right. Yeah, I, so the only thing I will say is I am not going to exceed a balanced budget. So I, I may have a goal, I may say 250, right? But if the budget only is accommodating 135 of it, we're going to have to look and town meeting can't bind a future town meeting. It, 
that's the that would be the hard part about spreading it over two years is that mm -hmm. employees would have to go on faith. Having said that, they got a four percent last year. Well, actually, they got longevity one year, a four percent the next year. Comp reform part one, comp reform part two. <clears throat> that's the only way Douglas can afford to do it, and that's how we have to do it. But the goal, the commitment to make it better, is still there, and I think it's palpable. Matt, what's the number for FY24 at the moment of folks that fit into this compensation table before? Well, how many people are likely to benefit? You no, know, how many people actually are in the table? How many positions? Paul. I'm going to count dots for a second. You got two, seven, eleven. So sixteen or seventeen management level positions. Probably eight or nine office assistants. Highway, call it, call it five for now. But you know, making that number six is a goal, right? Uh, what am I up to? Fifteen, thirty. 30. We we'll probably have another four or five dispatchers. Then you have got some miscellaneous categories because you have part-time employees. So remember that it, that mm -hmm. affects them too. Mm -hmm. um, say another ten people, part-time mm -hmm. employees. Forty-five maybe. Yeah, about well, forty-five okay. people. Um, and when it's done, whether it's one year or two, so long as it's bought into by one or two town meetings. <laughs> We may be 250 up and over, if you will, base plus regular plus increase the cola, yeah. right yeah. for the two years. 250 up, and you'll feel confident that for those 45 or so positions, we fundamentally restructure how they are compensated. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And uh, I want to throw this back in here. I did this a long time ago, but I consider it to be finished product, so it'll be in this reform is adjusting the call firefighter rates to reflect more accurately the overall pay structure of the fire department. So that that comes into the budget basically as I, I did a fair amount of estimation on this, about a seven to seven and a half percent increase in the call firefighter budget. Okay. But after your work over the next couple of weeks, the expectation is we'd see a proposal mm -hmm. that lined up really initially the 250, and then we'd see where it fit on a, a yeah. red or black, yeah. and then decide accordingly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions? Comments? Can I ask one question, kind of off topic a little bit? You said uh, departments 1%, does that exclude what we've estimated the school will get? No. No. So we are, we have made a commitment to the Douglas Public Schools as part of the, how we can swing this teacher contract for a 2% commitment. Now, what we do above and beyond 2% will depend on where the budget comes out. Yeah. But so that 2% is in the budget and into future years through the end of the teacher contract. We're also transferring from free cash, you know, one more installment this year mm -hmm. to finalize that contract. It'll be a little bit less than half of what it was last year in terms of a transfer. But in, in our capital budget process and in our management of our overall financial structure, if we bear that in mind, that that free cash has already been obligated. Mm -hmm. It's 300 and some odd. 330, 340, I think is the number. Follow up, Ryan. You make um, some. Will, so I wasn't here. I wasn't here last year, so I'm a little unclear on the teachers' contract, the new teachers' contract, well, and the well, structure. Oh, yeah, no, I, I don't want to take. <laughs> everyone, that's why I was. Heather will tell you. I, I don't want to take everyone's time. <laughs> so you said the length of the contract is at three years, five years, three. three. So the next three years we've. Estimated two more years. Two more years. That would the schools will get a two percent increase is what we're shooting for. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. As a start. Now, where where are the moving parts there? 
Really depends what our dear friends at BVT do. <laughs> uh, last year we weren't their target, somebody else was. Mm -hmm. So somebody else got whacked last year, not us. I forget who it was. Oh, what do I want to say? Somebody had a huge, maybe it was Northbridge. Northbridge had an increase of Grafton went down, we went down, so it's. We may have hit our high water mark, we don't know. Um, I have them in the budget for something, the, my forecast model, for something like a seven. Now if that, were, if that pressure were to ease off, that would be huge. It would be we're really nice. Sending, we're now sending kids to Princeton and Harvard. <laughs> well, we are. I hate to laugh. I'm just, uh, I'm we are. So that was I'm not public doing. school system yeah. is pretty darn competitive. Oh, I thought you were saying BVT. No. That's why no. I laughed. Douglas Public School System. The Vote Tech School sent the kids to Harvard. We've got a kid at Harvard, we've got a kid at Princeton. Yeah. In the last two graduating classes. So you can come. None of that matters. We've the got Douglas two kids in a Georgetown in the last five years. That's Douglas what. Public School System <laughs> can go anywhere you want. Yeah, exactly. And so that's what our seventh and eighth grade program should be, should be pitching. I think there's been a change in atmosphere. I think the new superintendent is really promoting the schools. Fantastic. in a way that is very encouraging. And, and we're concentrating more on the STEM process too as mm -hmm. well and having kids explore earlier by the time they get to eighth grade they've already made that determination whereas before there wasn't there. So yes, yeah. the goals are yeah. changing the course. Yeah. We don't sell it short. Two kids to George. Two kids. And they're not even going for the basketball anymore because we can't get any worse they than can. we are now. <laughs> We're going for the poli side, we're, right, Matt? We're going for the bottom of the Big East. <laughs> <laughs> so, Matt, do you feel comfortable that the process that you're in already will bear fruit in the two weeks? or? Well, it has to. But yeah. it's, uh, I mean, it's a lot of work for nothing if it doesn't. So, obviously, we're going to get it over the finish line. But I, this has our, been our pattern dealing with, with Finance Committee and Select Board is to try to get you in mm -hmm. early so you can not have to ask these questions if you like this right thing. before it's due. So. Send them back. Send the double secret so program Matt, back. It's not that secret. I just would rather not have it yeah, floating. Yeah, all right. Matt, when, <coughs> if it's one year or two years, when when will these um, salaries change? So the idea would be they would be in the budget and they would change July 1st. July 1st, okay. All right. Any other questions for Matt or anything for us, Mr. Wojcik? I've been doing a lot of talking. I think I'm all done. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, then. Um, Is that a sigh of relief from <laughs> Mr. D'Amico? <laughs> I hope it wasn't that. It's 8.15. I hope it wasn't that open. <laughs> you, you try to point the microphone away, it still picks up the sigh of relief. <laughs> so, um, you can stay and chat with us, or if you need to leave, you can do that too. But um, I'll be here if you need me. I'm going to pack up. Well, the next thing on our agenda, Matt, while you're here, I had talked. You had your chance. Yeah. You had your chance. It was like a half a second. I'm going to fill my mouth with chocolate so yeah. I can't answer yeah. any you questions. You had only a half a second to get. No, he didn't give me long. Yeah. But <laughs> so we had talked about uh, asking questions of department heads through you and. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, over the last couple of weeks, I've been reading the public meeting law. Information, I think if it'd be just tighter if we didn't do that and just um, did our homework with SharePoint. And when people come, we'll go around the table first and see if anybody has specific questions about any line item. And then once we're done with that, then let the department heads do their big picture stuff. But it's, I just, and some of you pointed this out to me too. I watched the meeting again. And, the minute you start doing back and forth mm -hmm. with questions, you're just asking for trouble. I think Heather, you, you, you were quite clear about that. So, and Matt, you're busy enough to be the hey, middle. Well, man. nobody's asked me any questions. I, you, to be the middleman of question and answer, you've got other stuff to do. So, is that okay with everybody if we approach it that way? Mm -hmm. That when sure. the departments are here, we'll first see if anybody has questions on the, the spreadsheet, assuming they'll be substantive, and then we'll let them do their sort of big picture stuff. Does that make sense to you too, Matt? Yep. So Gene, um, I think if we could communicate that the department heads that when they come, the first step will be just FinCon people might have questions about specific things in the budget. And then after that, they have the floor to give their sort of big picture view of things. How does that sound? 
That sounds fine. Are you looking for, you had sent a document out a couple meetings ago asking for their three goals? I think if they could write them out beforehand and we could get them, just to reflect upon them before they come, that would be helpful. Yeah. And maybe bullet form. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have uploaded, I know Adam and John have supplied some information, so there's an FY24 budget under SharePoint, and I'm going to put department subfolders under that, so you can look in information under each subfolder, because I know John had already sent me some. I mean, yeah, I thanks for doing that. Huh? Yeah, you didn't. You were going to come by and look at our maintenance records. You didn't, so I just sent them to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that was one thing Carol really wanted to look into, is how people are maintaining Thing. So that's one thing I've asked them to do. And I only provided the salt. I asked for that history because you said you weren't going to ask for the prices. And when you say you're not going to ask for something <laughs> over and over, someone's going to ask. So I just add them. So the salt prices are up there. But that's the only reason why it's up there. So the process will be as we get information from the departments, that stuff will be up on SharePoint. That's the, the So we can look at it before we, we meet. Correct. Okay. Don't put it past me to go buy a whole bunch of salt. Because okay. it's sitting in a huge pile of the Port of Providence. It's got to be a seller's, a buyer's it's, market. It's not getting salty. a buyer's market. Uh, it will be. I don't know right. what they're going to do with that. It's kind of in the way. Yeah. Yeah. So is that okay with everybody? We'll yes. just proceed yes. that way. We'll give yes. everybody a chance to ask questions about specific line yeah. items and then we'll go big picture. All right, Gene. Let's look at the schedule I have here. Can we? Can you fill in any more dates for us so far? Um, I did work with Lisa today on the timeline. Um, April 11th will be your public hearing. Okay. We will need the information back by checking with the printer to be sent out to the printer the morning of April 13th. So you have a very short turnaround for that. Uh, I did ask. Uh, Mike Fitzpatrick for capital on the 28th. Okay. By then, the capital committee should have gone through their process and February have a document. Or March. A uh, March. I'm sorry. Did I say April? No, you said oh, the 28th. Okay. But okay. I'm, I'm working backwards. Oh, okay. I know Howard doesn't want April 4th, so I was trying to avoid April, April 4th. April 4th is okay. Oh, I didn't think you wanted that date. April 4th is okay. We're going to leave that one alone. If we need it's it. the extra one. Yeah. If, if that was the extra one. Yeah. Um, the 28th, and, and again, it depends. February 28th? On, February 28th, I'm sorry, I'm going up. Um, how many do you reasonably think you're going to departments get through one night? Because the, the departments that I'm looking for to come before you are highway, public building, police, fire, ambulance. On the 28th? I don't know if that's doable or not doable. You think half you know, an hour each? Of the big ones, I mean, like police, fire, highway. If we've done our due diligence, I mean, there shouldn't be too many line items. It's the same line items. Mm -hmm. Cost. Inflation has taken place. Mm -hmm. So. I'm not here the 28th. Well, February 20th. Yes. In two weeks, I will not I be think here. we can do it. Yeah. I'll just tell you from the federal government side, you have 10 minutes. Yeah. That's it. We're moving. And we've talked now quite a few times this season about trying to limit the mm -hmm. minutia mm -hmm. analysis. So let's do it. Yeah. You think we could do four different ones on the 28th then? Feb 28th? Again, that's... Yes. The, the try problem it? is all four are going to want to come in at 7 o'clock. So highway... <laughs> <laughs> Please. Well, they can't Fire. all come in at 7, so... <laughs> Public works. And they're all early, early, we'll be, early morning seven. start, so... So that would be... The, the Adam's the one here. He can go first. <laughs> you can skip me. We can do it right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you wouldn't come with that, John. Um, oh, so oh. it would be public building. It would be highway, police, fire, yep. ambulance. Yeah. And we're going to okay. try to just be as efficient as we can. Will we need to meet on March 21 then, Gene? Keep the clock. Well, that depends. So my thought process, yeah. March 28th, would be capital and the special articles on the town meeting as a first run through. Okay. Um, the question is, do you want to meet with Council on Aging, Library, um, those smaller departments that really aren't going to have a huge change in their budget other than the comp? Are you, do you want, not that I want to shortchange them, but you will have your opportunity to have them here at the public hearing as well on the April 11th. But that's a decision. You don't have to make it tonight. 
um, whether or not you want to meet with those smaller departments. I would just advocate that I would like them to come forth. And again, if we do a 10 minute, we can shoot them through within an hour. I would advocate that it may behoove us as a committee to listen to their requirements because 1% for some of them, depending on what's going on, I think due diligence, you know. March 21 then, Heather? Sure. Can I agree. I, I think it's useful to have each committee, frankly, for both us to learn and them to feel uh, respected seen. Yes. and, and yep. that their piece is a significant piece of the town budget and about. So then on the 21st, I'll request Council on Aging Library, um, Community Development, Board of Health, and I think Board of Health is Monitor Wells, Lee and Phil Maintenance, mm -hmm. yep. Board of Health, Nurse, Transfer Station. Like, I think that will fill your meeting. And then the 28th, we can do capital. You can do your special articles as a first run through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then if you want water sewer in here. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. think we should do water sewer with all the projects they've been doing. And that, if we run that, might leave us not needing April 4. No, what day of the police and Matt, do you have a feeling how many articles will be on the warrant? We talking ten or forty or usually like fifteen. Well the request for articles has is going out now and they have a couple weeks to get those in. Okay. I don't think we have much of an appetite to boil the ocean though. Okay. So some things that have been on before may not recur. Okay. They weren't approved the first time through. Not real excited about bringing them in. I, I haven't seen enough process to militate that they get another shot at it. So right. What's the deadline that the articles have to be into the office? More or less? Um, I'll get back to it. I'll send you an email. Okay. Um, so if we're going to look at them on April 11, our final one. Oh, you'll have the board of, board of selectmen will have it finalized the week before you. So you'll you'll have it after the board votes. Oh, good. Okay. But I think the, the warrant closes in March. The, the articles close in March. So, Gene, one more time. Let's just go through. So, February. I'll go through it from February. Yes, go with February 28th. What do you uh, have? February 28th will be public building, highway, police, fire, ambulance. March 14th, you have the two schools, Douglas Public Schools and BBT. March 21st will be your smaller group. So, Council on Aging, Library, Community Development, and Board of Health. If they can attend, um, you know. Yeah. And they'll all have their stuff up on SharePoint prior, we hope. We will, uh, that's the request. Um, March 28th will be the capital improvement, so the capital article. Sure. Um, water, sewer, and we can have our first run through on the special articles. Okay. Try to avoid April 4th. April 11th will be a public hearing, and then you'll be voting on the articles. That's where Dick Hol Dick's homework comes through. Um, he'll have to do it the very next day so we can do a quick turnaround to send to the printers. That will have to go on April 13th. Yeah. And then you won't be meeting again until May 1st. Okay. Any questions, anybody on the schedule? Is, and uh, we'll, we're going we're gonna to be in the Heather mode here and just be like the federal government, right? Super fast. <laughs> All right. Uh, any reserve funds tonight? One page? Gene? No, that was my rule. It's more than one page. I'm not reading it. Yeah. <laughs> Gene, any reserve funds for tonight? Not tonight. Not um, has have, okay. So open session for topics. I just want to know if people have been playing around with SharePoint a little bit and get used to the interface. And has everybody got so? I, Lynn just said that I didn't enter access. Has anybody else had that problem? So mm -hmm. I have. I got all. Of, I got bombarded that night, so I'm at Walt Disney World, right? And my phone is exploding because everybody's trying to get into SharePoint. But you I assume that that was the training session. Mm -hmm. So I'm, <laughs> you know. Hey, but you haven't put anything up on SharePoint yet. Well, this your whole your whole last couple of years of work is there actually, yeah. so it's full. There's a lot of stuff on SharePoint. But when I log on, I don't see a new thing that Matt Wojan put up though. No, I mean I, a couple of things. I I closed off my. I stopped sharing my worksheet. Okay. So I could do this stuff. Okay. Because it was there. It was there. 
So. I just never saw it, I guess. So. Okay. So now I'm creating the other yep. document for my department heads to use, and you will see that live as it gets. Okay. Because most of them are ready. It'll be done quickly. So, I'm sorry. Uh, all I think I see in SharePoint is the email Gene sent about the uh, guy from the pension fund. That's really all I have in there, so I don't know if... So there's an FY24 budget there, so that's where I'm putting the information. So the way the website, it, you are, a uh, SharePoint is actually a website. Yeah. Well, you know this. Um, go all the way over to the right, the documents, and click on yeah. that. And you should get a whole bunch of folders. Okay, I will try again. I, tr I looked twice once over the weekend once this morning. I didn't see anything It's in alphabetical, there. so FY24 budget. I, I'm going to see if I can work with Dave to archive all the old stuff. I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't find up. anything. Though. All I have is that email from you. We can look at Dick's after. He might not have the access. That's what I'm saying. So I'm not he sure if I'm new if there's a yeah. button that's going to go. Or yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd like Matt, once we adjourn, if you could Dave look over my shoulder on this and just show me. Okay. Any, like anybody have anything out. else? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think we have a, need a motion to adjourn. I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn. Okay, Sandy moves we adjourn. Any seconds? Thanks for coming. I second. Lynn seconds. No, Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain, we adjourn at 8.30.